my name is Dr. Barry Colfer, and I am the Director of Research here at the IIEA. I am delighted to welcome you to today's events, our first of 2023, and the third presentation of our Environmental Resilience Lecture Series, which the IIEA is delighted to organize in conjunction with the Environmental Protection Agency, EPA. I'd like to take the opportunity as ever to thank the EPA for their sponsorship of this series and for their ongoing support of the Institute. Today, we are joined by Professor Emily Schuckberg, Director of Cambridge Zero and Professor of, of Environmental Data Science at the University of Cambridge and Fellow of Darwin College. I'd like to thank Professor Schuckberg for being able to take the time to speak with us today. By way of introduction, Professor Schuckberg is a climate scientist and mathematician, a Fellow of the Cambridge Institute for Sustainability Leadership, an Associate Fellow of the Centre for Science and Policy, and a Fellow of the British Antarctic Survey. Professor Schuckberg is also a Professor of Environmental Data Science at the Department of Computer Science and Technology at the University of Cambridge. Professor Schuckberg leads the UKRI Ukri Centre for Doctoral Training on the application of AI to the study of environmental risks. A polar expert, Professor Schuckberg previously led a UK national research programme on the Southern Ocean and its role in climate. Sounds super cool. In 2016, Professor Schuckberg was awarded an OBE for Services to Science and the Public Communication of Science. Professor Schuckberg is co-author with HRH, the Prince of Wales, and Tony Juniper of the Lady Bird book on climate change. The title of Professor Schuckberg's presentation today is Artificial Intelligence and Climate Change Research and the Work of Cambridge Zero. Professor Schuckberg will speak for approximately 20 minutes, and she does have slides. After which, uh, after the uh, presentation, we'll move as ever to the Q&A session with you, our audience, and thank you for being with us. You'll be able to join the discussion using the Q&A function on Zoom, which you should see on your screens. And please feel free to send your questions in throughout the session as they occur to you, and we'll get to as many of them as we can. We encourage you to identify yourself and any affiliation you may have when asking a question. Finally, from me, a reminder that today's presentation and Q&A are both on the record. And please feel free to join, to join the discussion on Twitter using the handle at IIEA. First, however, um, please let me hand over to uh, Mary Gurry, Water Program Manager at EPA, who will offer some opening remarks before Professor Schuckberg's intervention. Thank you, Professor, and over to you, Mary. Uh, thank you, Barry. And uh, also on behalf of the EPA, I'd like to extend a very well, warm welcome to Professor Schuttberg and thank her for her time today. I'm sure it's going to be a fascinating talk. I'm, I'm certainly looking forward to it. Um, data, of course, is at the heart of what we do in the EPA, whether for our work on climate, water quality, air quality or, or waste. And it's an ongoing challenge for us and indeed all scientific organisations to get the best out of our data you know, in terms of understanding and communicating the problems and finding solutions. And I'm particularly interested in hearing about the role artificial intelligence can play in meeting that challenge. In this keynote address, Professor Schuttberg will give an insight into how the latest in artificial intelligence and computer science can assess and monitor climate risks and contribute to sustainable solutions in adaptation, mitigation and policy. Professor Schuckberg will offer examples of the water-related challenges in her recent work in the peatland surrounding Cambridge. Water and climate change are, of course, inextricably linked, so she'll be discussing interconnected issues such as water management, risks to water systems, and examples of using artificial intelligence in understanding problems with water systems. Finally, Professor Schuckberg will give an overview of Cambridge Zero's facilitation of decarbonisation, research, education, and engagement across sectors. So with that, I'll now hand over to Professor Schuttberg to deliver her address. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. And it's a, it's a pleasure to um, speak to you all today. Um, so if I just uh, share my presentation. Um, so what I want to do today is just give you um, a little bit of insight into some of the work that we're doing in Cambridge, but probably more importantly, um, how we're going about doing um, that work in Cambridge. And if there's one overarching theme, I think, of what we've been trying to implement over recent years, it's radical collaboration. And what I mean by that is radical collaboration, collaborations um, across interdisciplinary research areas within the university in Cambridge, uh, creating collaborations that 
previously simply wouldn't have been thought of between different disciplines, but equally radical collaboration beyond the university. So in particular, um, so that we are connecting together in a really um, effective way, the research cycle with the policy cycle, so that there's continual dialogue between the two, but that we're equally integrating into those two cycles, um, the needs and um, and the ideas from all the different stakeholders that are relevant to different environmental problems. So I'm going to give you some examples where we've been trying to implement um, that uh, viewpoint, both in terms of um, some of the key problems that we're looking at addressing, but also very specifically on that interface between how we start to use the new um, tools um, and technologies that are available, particularly through um, artificial intelligence and associated um, and, and, and associated techniques and apply those into the environmental um, science domain. So um, let me just dive in. There's three particular examples um, that I'm going to just give you um, uh, to give you a, a, put a, bit of, a little bit of flavor um, onto, um, onto what I've just described. Um, the first is I'm going to, um, as was said in the introduction, give you an example of some of the work that we're undertaking, um, looking in the first instance at the landscape, at, well, coincidentally around Cambridge, which is a very um, uh, heavily peatland landscape and has significant environmental as well as actually social challenges associated with it, and how we're adopting a whole system approach to addressing that challenge, and I'll explain what I mean by that. I'll then give you a couple of examples of the work that we're doing applying AI to specific environmental problems, and the two problems that I'm going to describe are associated with flooding. Um, and then finally, I'll very briefly um, explain um, what we're doing in terms of providing integrated solutions to environmental challenges. And if I have an opportunity, if I have time at the end, I'll tell you a little bit more broadly what we're doing with Cambridge Zero across the university. So let me dive in, first of all, um, with the whole system approach. Um, we have recently, um, in the last, uh, just over, but, but this time last year, in fact, um, received significant funding from UK research councils um, to set up a new centre that's focused on looking at how we can develop optimal solutions for landscape regeneration. And critical to this is looking in a very holistic way um, at that challenge. So looking at um, potential alternative land management practices from the perspective of both climate change related to challenges, um, biodiversity related challenges, but then critically also those social challenges, recognizing that solutions need to work for um, the people who live and work in those landscapes and for the people who those landscapes end up serving. And so there's a set of, you know, if you like root challenges associated with that, that we're looking at um, in terms of understanding how outcomes vary with alternative land management practices, what optimal solutions might be, and optimal will be very much dependent on who the different stakeholders might be, and then how those solutions can be um, incentivized and supported both from a policy framework perspective, but also more broadly from financial instruments, for example, and how um, we can uh, work with businesses to help support um, these uh, solutions. Um, the particular project that we're working on, um, we're working in the University in Cambridge in partnership with um, other organizations, and some of those are other research organizations, but also um, uh, critically some of the NGO um, organizations. And the, the particular project that I'm going to describe to you, um, is the, our first uh, landscape that we're considering is the Finland around Cambridge, but then there are other landscapes in the UK and, uh, and eventually internationally that we're also going to be looking at with this approach. So this is um, a view of the landscape, the Fenland landscape around Cambridge. It's heavily um, peatland landscape. Most of it was reclaimed land from the um, drainage of the Fens in the in the 17th century. You can see here the drainage ditches, the waterways that crisscross um, the landscape, and you can also see um, the, the the rich peatland, heavily agriculturally um, farmed. Uh, landscape. And the challenges are really, from a, an environmental perspective, are, are twofold. First of all, um, there's really significant um, greenhouse gas emissions from the peatlands, and the peatland itself is wasting away at a very significant 
rate, um, which causes its own challenges. But then additionally, there are significant water challenges in the region and water challenges from two different perspectives. Um, on the one hand, too much water because it, this is a, a region that's largely below sea level. And so there are really significant flooding risks associated with the region, especially in the context of future climate change. But additionally, it's a region where there's actually significant water shortages. It's one of the driest parts of the UK. Um, and there's significant development, housing development in particular, occurring in the region, which is putting significant strain on the water resources. And these two are have the, the, the challenges, the emissions from the peatlands and the challenges of um, water in the region are connected together um, because one of the ways in which you might uh, look to limit the amount of uh, greenhouse gas emissions from the peatlands is to reflood, to re-wet um, those peatlands. So there's a connection. These are not independent challenges, although historically they've often been perceived to be independent challenges. So what we're looking at is whether or not there are innovative solutions that we could look to to the future of this Fenland landscape in a way that is beneficial to um, climate, beneficial to nature and to the biodiversity. You can see this isn't a particularly rich biodiverse landscape at the moment, the way that it's managed, but crucially also that works for the people who live and work in this landscape. And, it, uh, and the Fenlands are one of the most socially deprived parts of the UK. So that latter um, aspect is critically important. It's also critically important that this is a hugely important agricultural region and um, a, a, a very large percentage of many of the UK salad crops are grown in this region. So recognizing the um, economic importance is also critically important. So we brought together this um, collaboration, which really is an incredibly diverse group of different academic disciplines across the university, um, most of whom have never worked together before. So we're bringing together um, people on the climate and on the conservation side of things who haven't traditionally worked together. We're bringing in people on the technology side of things to bring in um, both um, new technologies to do measurements of all sorts of different kinds. And I can give you one example of that in a second. We're bringing in the computer scientists to make sure we're using the latest data science, machine learning and AI um, to help support our monitoring um, frameworks. We're bringing in the social scientists and the economists and the business school um, so that we've got um, that broader holistic view um, uh, together as well. And then there's a very wide range of external partners that we brought in um, additionally um, from across the, the piece, um, people from the policy side of things, people from the NGO community, people from many different aspects of the business community, but also people from community groups themselves. Um, and one of the things that we found most powerful is being able to um, connect together to existing community groups of, across many different levels, um, many of whom are themselves are membership groups um, covering other organizations, so that we're really starting to um, create this in a very much a co-designed way, um, and uh, that's been critically important. So to give you just one example of uh, some of the innovations that we're trying to bring into this um, project, critical to understanding what optimal solutions to alternative land management practices might be, is monitoring um, what the current state of the landscape is in terms of different climate and biodiversity um, metrics and understanding how that might change under different possible um, alternative um, land management practices. One of the ways in which we're trying to introduce innovation is looking at how we can um, uh, adopt much um, broader monitoring of those landscapes. And we've, uh, well, particular technology that we started to adopt is um, implementing low cost sensor networks. Um, and in particular, we're taking, we're transferring knowledge from the monitoring of urban air quality and using um, very similar sensors that are used in an urban air quality context in the field. Um, first of its kind so that we can create a much um, clearer map of um, different greenhouse gas um, emissions and those sensors you can see photographs here we we installed them at, um, at a farm level uh, at the end of last year and the first data we're expecting um, to be coming in over over the next few weeks and it's just one example where we've 
uh, linked together and transferred knowledge from across a different discipline into, into this particular discipline. So now I'd like to move on to a, a specific example of where we're using AI um, to start to tackle environmental problems. And again, as was mentioned in the introduction, we're essentially looking at using AI in two different ways. The first is in related to what I was just describing in terms of assessing and monitoring risks. And the second is how we can use AI in terms of helping to contribute to developing sustainable solutions. And I'm going to give you um, an example, first of all, on how we're using AI in terms of ex uh, actually monitoring risks. Um, Flooding um, is an important um, concern in terms of future climate change, um, both in terms of coastal flooding and also in terms of um, ri uh, river flooding. Uh, in both instances, in different ways, we're looking at how we can um, create new ways of producing future forecasts of flood events um, using machine learning and AI-based approaches. So in terms of coastal flooding, um, what we've been doing is developing new models of uh, coastal flooding where we are using past records of impactful coastal flooding and uh, training models to classify whether or not there is or isn't likely to be a flooding event based on different climate variables. And then we're using that model that we've classification model that we've trained to predict the risk of future coastal flood events based on climate model output. Um, and this is an entirely new way of um, uh, creating coastal flood forecasts. We've also been looking at river flow forecasts, looking at peak flow rates in terms of um, rivers, and similarly looking to train a model based on um, climate variables and then use that to predict out into the future. Um, one of the things that we've been trying to do in terms of developing uh, that model is produce a, a method of producing forecasts that would work anywhere in the world. And so for the UK in particular, we have very good river gauge measurements that we can train models, uh, machine learning models on but for many other parts of the world we don't have that um, record so what we've been looking at is how can we develop a model that's trained on UK data but could be used applied elsewhere on data where we don't have that river gauge um, measurements and um, so what we've done in order to do that is include not just the information about the river gauge rivers themselves but also information about the catchment, because that is information that we conceivably could have um, for, uh, for places that where we don't have the gauged measurements. Um, you can see from the, the, these are actually actual results for different rivers in the UK, and most of them are projections and are, um, and the actual observations are doing very well. That Where, where you see the data points align with that um, solid line, uh, diagonal solid line is where we've got a good model, um, but you see one instance where we don't have a good model, and that one instance where we don't have a good model of the peak flow rates is where there's large amounts of um, abstraction of water from that river, and that's um, resulted in a, in difficulties in in our prediction system. But we've been able to to account for that um, by um, including descriptions uh, that give an indication of the likelihood of there being, for example, large amounts of abstraction from those rivers, and and so being able to create a system that is actually really quite powerful in terms of producing peak flow rates that we can apply elsewhere in the world. It does depend on um, information about the catchment. And we're also looking at how we can use uh, the latest machine learning AI approaches to automatically determine from various different satellite remote sensing data, critical information about the catchments that can then be fed into those machine learning models. So altogether, this is really transforming our abilities to be able to um, make projections into the future about some of these critical um, risks. Now, the last um, example that I want to just speak um, briefly about is how 
we're create, starting to create integrated solutions to um, environmental challenges, bringing together many of the things that I've just described. And the example that I was going to give is a relatively new centre that we've um, launched in the university focused around carbon credits. This is bringing together um, that expertise from the environmental sciences with computer science expertise and indeed expertise from um, the business and finance um, side of things. Uh, what we have been, this actually initially um, started from the university itself wanting to understand how, um, from an operational perspective, we could be um, looking to implement um, robust uh, offsetting schemes for some of the emissions that we currently don't um, know how to eliminate. And so we wanted to look at the different potential offsetting schemes that we might be able to invest in and assess um, how robust they might be. We brought in our own academics from the conservation side of things to help us make those assessments. And then we started to think, well, actually we could be looking at how we can bring in um, our computer scientists and others to um, actually uh, create an, an, an entire, an entire um, as it says here, distrib uh, decentralized marketplace around carbon credits. And the idea here is that um, we have created a framework for robustly an anal analyzing different offsetting schemes, both in terms of their climate impact, but also broader impacts um, associated with their impacts on biodiversity or on, or on social challenges, as well as critical issues associated with, for example, the permanence of the offsetting schemes. We've implemented based on the um, uh, input from the computer science uh, side of things, mechanisms for monitoring and verifying in a robust and and um, and indeed tradable way um, the those different um, offsetting schemes, and thereby creating this idea of a decentralized um, marketplace where through um, a form of blockchain technology, we're able to keep a traceability of exactly that robustness of the different carbon credits that then could be um, onwardsly traded. So I hope that gives a little bit of a sense of um, some of the things that we're looking at. As I say, the critical element to all of these is radical collaboration internally within the university, but then critically also outside of the university. And then the very final thing that I was going to um, describe is just Cambridge Zero itself. Um, if you're interested in finding more, you can visit our, our website. Cambridge Zero is the university's umbrella um, for all the activities that we're undertaking associated with climate. Um, and that includes all the research activities that I've, you know, some of which I've just been describing, but also all the activities we're undertaking in terms of education, both of our own students internal to Cambridge, but also the education we can provide beyond the university at all stages of the, of the lifelong learning journey. So looking at school education and particularly working with our partners in Cambridge University Press and assessment, as well as beyond university, including executive education and engaging um, with uh, education on the policy side of things. Uh, and then looking at how we can put in place processes um, whether that's through industrial collaboration or entrepreneurship, for example, to ensure that ideas and innovations happening within the university are rapidly moved out into real world deployment and um, scale up. And then finally, as I was just describing with the offsetting side of things, we're looking at how we can both uh, look at ambitious decarbonization and, and, and supporting sustainability within the university's operations, but critically how we can ensure that we're bringing in our own academic and other expertise to help inform that ambitious um, policies. So I hope that's given you a little bit of a flavor of what we're doing in Cambridge. And I'm going to be really delighted to take questions. That's absolutely brilliant, Professor. Thank you so much. Really, really riveting, really interesting. I, I have a couple of questions myself just to kick things off, but. Uh, we're joined by a fairly sizable group here. Hello, everybody. So I look forward to your questions flooding in. Um, a really practical one, just on what you were saying uh, momentarily about Cambridge Zero. Can you just talk about where it originated? Like, 
was it something that uh, there was, you know, particular pioneers, uh, you know, was it because of the work of a, of a person or a group of people or, or, or could you say? Yeah, so it, in, in a sense, it was bottom up and top down within the university. So the bottom up side of things um, came very much from the students in the university wanting the university to be doing more, particularly around climate. So there was a strong imp impetus from that direction. And the top down um, perspective is that overall, the university's mission is to contribute to society through its education and research and, and broader engagement. And there was a sense that to be true to the university's mission, we really ought to be doing something significant on this, um, on this challenge. And so those two things came together. Um, and uh, in 2019, November 2019 was when we officially launched um, yeah. Cambridge Zero, and we're still very much spinning it up. Um, but you know, we've achieved a huge amount over the last couple of years in terms of really mm -hmm. starting to make a step change difference um, in how we uh, uh, how we respond. Cambridge is, is a place that I know well and, and love very much. And I would always think if I think the university began in 1209, so if if it can change, then surely we all can. You know? Yeah. Indeed. Um. I have one very specific question I'll put to you. Then I have others I hold in reserve as I, I want to privilege those who are asking questions online. When you had the lovely image of the tree and when you were talking about the um, the whole systems approach, without being too hard-nosed about it, I noticed one of the roots made reference to incentives. Can, can you say anything more about what sorts of incentives you envisage? Yeah, well, I mean, I think we were in large part um, thinking of that through the lens uh, it, it very particularly in the UK context of the you know post EU um, mm -hmm. uh, potential land management incentive um, is the most obvious direct um, sense. Mm -hmm. but in a slightly in that slightly broader um, sense, where we're looking very much at multiple stakeholders who are using these landscapes, then it's probably in a slightly broader way than just the pure financial incentives that might be associated with um, different future. Um, uh, uh, subsidy regimes, which is uh, you know, which is one of the critical elements, but it's just as much about, um, in in a much broader sense, um, mm -hmm. understanding how to encourage different um, approaches. So I'll give you a specific um, yep. a specific example. Uh, what I've quickly discovered, uh, or we've qu quickly discovered, um, that there are a very diverse range of different users of landscapes who can, if they're not involved at an early stage and helping to think through different solutions, can create significant barriers to them ever happening. And um, so one of the one of the potential solutions to um, to the challenges, as I was sort of alluding to, is um, around rewetting some of the landscape. Uh, we're looking at, for example, how we might be able to, rather than we re rewet the entire landscape, which has all sorts of potential implications for different users of that landscape, do something that's um, more nuanced and maybe rewet, use the drainage ditches that exist in the landscape to ena enable us to rewet almost on a rotation basis, different, um, you know, field by field. Mm -hmm. Where there have been um, issues in the past um, with uh, different proposals, they've often come from very diverse different groups. So the anglers get upset if you talk about doing something different to um, some of the waterways in the region, or the archaeologists get upset if you thought, you know, so it's understanding where all those different potential users of landscapes, how they're using those landscapes, and how you can collectively incentivize um, in, a, in a much more broader sense of the word, um, uh, the involvement and uh, and buy-in of all those different groups seems to be critical to the success of this. Extremely and interesting. That's, that's kind of part of the whole systems approach is understanding where those different perspectives are coming from and therefore where the barriers are, but more importantly, where the opportunities are. Yeah, that's, I think that's lovely language that I've heard you use before, the idea of removing these barriers and to try and break down silos, which is what we try and do as an institute as well to break down silos between different forms of thinking. I'm going to turn to some of our questions now, Professor. So the first one I'll put to you is from Peter McLoon. Peter McLoon is a trade unionist and a board member at the Institute. Hello, Peter. I'll read at um, some small length. Although we seem to have the tools to anticipate catastrophic events, 
resulting from the climate crisis we are, that we are currently experiencing, we seem to be light years away from developing technological solutions to impending disaster. Uh, excuse me. Surely changes to human behavior at every level in every part of the globe remains the only solution that will reverse emissions? I'll put the question part to you again because I kind of stumbled there, forgive me. Surely changes to human behavior at every level in every part of the globe remains the only solution that will reverse emissions. Yeah, so this is, you know, can we, is technology just going to solve this for mm -hmm. us or is that, or can we not wait on that uh, for, for technology to solve it or do we not, you know, do we not really need to be encouraging significant behavior change? And there's a sense in which, I mean, you, we need both. <laughs> and actually the both and also the interaction between the two. Um, so take, for example, transport. We know that tra in the UK currently, transport accounts for the largest share of mm -hmm. our of our emissions um, since we've uh, significantly decarbonized our energy um, supply. And uh, well, you know, on one level, we know that there's somewhat of a technology solution to the to the transport challenge in the sense of electrification. But we also know that behavioural change is also going to play a significant role in that. We know that investment in public services is critically important, but it's actually, again, taking that whole systems approach, um, there's also an element that is um, more fundamental, which is around how which is around land use, which is around land use planning, which mm -hmm. is around looking at how we can design neighborhoods in a way that eliminates the need for so much um, uh, mechanized transport so that you can walk or cycle to critical services. Um, and so it's about taking that much more holistic approach to generating solutions that does look from the perspective of multiple different users so that we can integrate technology, but also integrate and support the behavioral changes that are required. I think there's a, a natural follow on question here from Francis Jacobs, who's the former director of the EP liaison office in Dublin and a member of the Institute. Hello, Francis. Francis says it makes so much sense to have integrated solutions to environmental problems. Has there been much resistance from individual disciplines and stakeholders to working together? I'm sure this is something you probably have a whole unit at Cambridge Zero puzzling over this. What can you tell us about resistance? Uh, so actually, I would say exactly the opposite. If this is done Ooh. right, then I've then it's been really inspiring because mm. people it, it, like it, it's really critical to create a trusted environment to allow that sort of dialogues to occur. But if you do, then I have discovered both within the university and also outside the university that it becomes uh, a hugely exciting forum for people uh, getting energized by the opportunity for creating new solutions. So in the research environment, we often say that the biggest advances are made at the interfaces between different disciplines, because that's where you can really... It, you know, it's, in a sense, it's um, some of the, th the the example I gave on the low cost sensors where we've taken something that was done in the urban air quality um, arena and taken it into the field. Those might sound like they're not very different, but they're very different disciplinary silos. Mm -hmm. People normally doing urban air quality don't normally have anything to do with the people um, doing conservation and, and, and rural rural. Um, uh, work. And so bringing those two together has been the way in which we've been able to create a significant step change um, in terms of how we've done things. That happens and it creates excitement in the research environment. And we found similarly that if we bring groups together in a trusted way so that they're actually able to talk constructively together, then we find exactly that same level of excitement by bringing together, um, if you like, stake user groups, different user mm -hmm. groups. And I was trying to divine it from your presentation and from my knowledge of Cambridge Zero, but Cambridge is, it's not unique, but one of the special features of the town is how integrated the university is with the town, right? That the university is spread throughout it, but there's obviously Chinese walls and barriers of various kinds, but where it does work, can you talk about the engagement between the university and, and the town specifically, whether it's the schools or local authority or businesses or anything like that? Yeah, so what, what, I, what I would say is that Cambridge is, is spread out across the, t the city of Cambridge, but actually, historically, we've not really integrated sure. significantly in the broader region. Um, and so we're very much um, forging away in terms of doing that. Um, and we're doing it um, through different 
through different mechanisms, significantly integrating with the various levels of local government that exist in the region, but also looking at leveraging any networks that we can to create those trusted um, communications channels. And one of those networks is, is the schools network, um, mm -hmm. because schools are central to every community. Mm -hmm. And um, and so we uh, one of the unique things about Cambridge is that associated with our Department for Education, we have a state primary school that is um, the only um, uh, exemplar teaching connected, um, as in, uh, sorry, it, you know, connected to a research environment teaching um, school in the in the country. Mm -hmm. But then, you know, we've been working closely with that primary school and then the network of primary schools in the region um, to uh, to really look to see how we can get deeply embedded in different communities. So that's just one example of where we're trying to uh, utilize the, the networks and channels that we have to make sure that we're really embedded um, in a very in a very deep way into understanding the challenges at a root cause level of different mm -hmm. communities and also the opportunities and the potential solutions. My um, connection with Cambridge began at Homerton um, a long time right. ago. And obviously I'm, well, Homerton, uh, for, for those on the call, have uh, has a strong tradition of, of teaching education. And I can vouch for that connection between the schools and the university. It's really, it's, it's a lovely thing and something that there's similar ventures in Ireland as well with um, things involving schools and the environment, but we can certainly learn from Cambridge Euro's experience, I'm sure. To follow up on Francis's question before taking a different tack, Francis just said um, the, the previous question I put to you, Professor. For example, how has the farming community responded to your ideas of re-wetting for increasing nature protection, if you can just give that as a specific example, relations with the farming yeah, community. Yeah, no, so no, well, 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 I can be kind of candid that, you know, mm -hmm. historically the farming community has often been at war with the conservation community um, because they feel they felt very much threatened by the idea that, you know, somebody, or, or and indeed with the policy community, I have to say as well, mm -hmm. the idea that somebody in Westminster might come out into the fens and tell the farmers in the fens what they, they might want to do doesn't go down um, too well, as you might, as you might imagine. Um, and and so that, that's where, you know, we've been working really hard to bring to help support constructive dialogue between the farming communities and the conservation communities in particular. Mm -hmm. And um, and where we have you know many of the innovative solutions that we have been starting to surface have been coming from the farming community themselves. And what we've discovered is that there's nobody who better understands the land than the farmers who, for many instances, have been farming that land for generations. And therefore, they are they have critical knowledge in terms of helping to develop the solutions. And the one thing that I have learned um, from talking to many of them is that. Um, more than many other groups that I talk to in terms of the climate related challenges, they really understand the long term and then and the need to leave land in a state that is going to be um, sustainable for generations. And so they're very committed to helping us think through what the potential solutions are. Um, but it's about doing that that trust is critical. Trust and fairness, I think, are the two most important words that I've that I've understood associated with generating um, solutions to climate related challenges that work for different communities. OK, in that spirit, Professor Schuckberg, there is a ton of questions that are coming in and I'm, I'm trying to organize them both in my mind and also loop some together when they're thematically related. So I'm going to put one further question to you now that regard it's building on your discussion of farming. Then I have a question about carbon, carbon credits and then a question about international collaboration. So we'll be moving around a little bit and, and thanks very much for your, for your candor in doing so. Alan Matthews says, a criticism of trying to integrate thousands of farms into greenhouse gas accounting is that the transaction costs of measuring and monitoring emissions will be very high. Looking at your small inexpensive sensor, how do you see the balance in the future between actual measurement of emissions and sequestration on farms and the modeling of emissions and sequestration using your AI algorithms? Take a moment if you wish. Yeah, no, well, as you, I mean, that's one of the really, um, the things that we're looking at in terms of the AI algorithms, because one of the things that you can do um, with AI is integrate data sets of different levels of fidelity. So mm -hmm. in terms of looking at global um, greenhouse gas inventories then we can that we are looking at how we can integrate together 
um, the data sets we have from remote sensing mm -hmm. on the one hand, the um, the national country level data sets that we have, um, and then different, um, you know, even down to field level um, data sets, how we can integrate them them together. And, and it is possible to use machine learning approaches in order to do that. And um, and then it's also possible. And, you know, another another key question um, that's also asked about this is um, in the moment we don't have good ways of being able to do those inventories at anything other than a national level, but it would be interesting and useful yeah. to, be able to get a much greater level of granularity. And so that is another key area of research that we're that we're looking at. And, and, and to the international partnerships question, absolutely not Cambridge alone. I mean, this is very much an international um, uh, collaboration that's required to do that sort of uh, good. Uh, that sort of approach. Can I ask just a really a real ladybird question? Um, mm -hmm. It's just for myself. When you were doing, you, you mentioned during the presentation, and this is before I get on to, to Mike and Daryl's questions. You said that the sensors were installed in November 22 and data is expected shortly. Just in like the most basic terms, what sort of data are you actually gathering? I mean, I can guess, but, but could you just explain it for a non-expert? Oh, this, I mean, the, the, those particular sensors. Sensors, um, yeah. Yeah, that, so it's, it is just carbon, well, primarily carbon flux measurements mm -hmm. so literally the amount of carbon dioxide that's coming out of the fields um and we're also looking at methane as well so okay. carbon dioxide and methane fluxes um and uh one of the so normally those are measured by very expensive flux towers mm -hmm. um and in order to be able to take the measurements from a particular sensor a small local sensor without the fancy equipment on a flux tower, um, we have to combine together the direct measurements that are made by the sensor with some modeling assumptions um, to account for, you know, aspects to do with the wind, for example, that can have implications for the fluxes. But getting back to, I think, was Peter McLuhan's question, it does sound like relatively affordable by kind of, you know, as compared to what some technology costs. I mean, it sounds like a, a relatively affordable way to do what you do, right? Well, so a typical annual cost of a flux tower can be, uh, you know, 50,000 or 100,000 a year. They're, they're expensive, mm -hmm. whereas these sensors really, you know, it's a few pounds. Amazing. It's, it's, Amazing. It's a big difference. But it's a different, it, they, they, they give you different information. And so it's a, having the combination of the two and the, being able to integrate them is what's really powerful. Yeah, very good. A bit of triangulation. Um, for, for Mike Brennan, uh, who is uh, Dr. Mike Brennan, senior researcher in environmental science at the Houses of the Oireachtas, so the, the Irish Houses, Houses, the Ar Irish Houses of Parliament. Hello, Mike. Could you speak a bit more about the carbon credits and what measures are in place to safeguard? It's a good question against large cash-rich polluters coming in and monopolising these offsets. Uh, yeah, well, yes, good, good, good question. Mm -hmm. So, so the, the the aspects that we have been looking at are, um, as I briefly described, associated with the robustness of the of the credits themselves. So, um, we've been looking at the leakage, the permanence, and the additionality in particular. So, the I mean, often the, this is easiest thought of in, in offsetting schemes are not only about tree planting, in fact, very definitely not only about tree planting, yeah. but often it's easiest to understand what those concepts are in terms of uh, uh, tree planting. So the permanence issue is around, you know, you might plant a tree and either it dies or it gets cut down. So it's not necessarily permanent, right? So that's the permanence um, issue. And you can monitor for that using remote sensing, satellite information into, uh, uh, over time. Um, the leakage aspect is that you might do um, reforestation or avoided deforestation in one area, and all that's happening is that you're displacing that from somewhere from somewhere else. So either you're stopping mm -hmm. the trees being cut down in one region and actually just the same number of trees are being cut down somewhere else instead, um, or, um, you, you know, as a similar form of, of, of leakage. So you want to make sure you're accounting for, for that. So that's another aspect that we're um, taking account of and um, quantifying and also monitoring. And then the third aspect is the additionality. So you might say, well, you know, whatever scheme it is is not you know does have some leakage associated with it it's not entirely permanent mm. but you still want to invest in it because there are all sorts of other benefits that you want to take into account of in some way as well so those aspects um are the aspects that we are currently in the current format of what we're looking at um focused on 
you know, it is also true that um, you know, you, you, there are all sorts of other ways in which the schemes could be um, exploited. And overarching in terms of um, offsetting and carbon credits, that certainly what the university's policy is, but I, what I would encourage everyone else's policy should be, is that they are something of a last resort. Everything that you could do to eliminate your emissions should be done first before looking at investing in offsetting schemes, because otherwise, and I think this is, you know, where a lot of the credibility of offsetting schemes at the moment is under scrutiny for, you know, effectively greenwashing and and, um, and worse, is that there simply isn't enough nature to go around or there isn't, <laughs> you know, enough opportunities to go around for everyone to offset all their emissions. Yeah. So there's a huge opportunity for double counting, yeah. and, you know, and, and all sorts of other challenges. Thanks, Professor. There's a question now from, from Daryl Gunning, and this was the international collaboration question, I promised. Uh, so to quote, apologising for raising the B word, the UK's withdrawal from the EU, but have you found that international co collaboration has been made more difficult following Brexit? And how are you dealing with this, considering climate change is an international crisis? And that's Daryl Gunning, marine biologist at the EPA. Uh, well, I mean, you, you know, clearly in many ways, yes. Um, the uh, There were many, many, uh, particularly EU projects that we were significantly involved in. We still have an involvement in those, but obviously on different terms. Um uh, which is disappointing. Um, but at the same time, uh, m you know, pretty much everything that we do on the environmental side of things uh, on one level has to be done at a global level. And so that global collaboration is absolutely continuing. Um, so, uh, it, you know, it's a sort of mixed story, really. OK, that's uh, very diplomatically put, Professor. Um, a handful more. I'll go to when well, I loop two questions together. No, I'll start with Philip Beck. Philip Beck, who is an IIA member, hello, Philip, uh, asks, it's rather specific, uh, are you looking at modelling other ecosystem services accruing due to afforestation, for example, soil erosion reduction, biodiversity increases in water bodies due to overshading by native trees, etc.? Thanks for the great presentation. Uh, 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 yes. So it, particularly in the Fenlands, there's not very many trees. Um, it's as you saw in the uh, yeah. photographs that I, that I showed you. Um, but the other landscapes that we're going on to look at in the Cairngorms and um, in Cumbria, the uh, uh, trees have a much more prominent part of the landscape. So mm -hmm. um, th those, some of those other aspects are absolutely things that we'll be looking at in, in some of the other landscapes. And in terms more generally of, um, you know, some of the research um, uh, initiatives that are taking part in the university, they're, they're, they're very broad um, mm -hmm. and, and encompass many of those different things. Great, very good. Thank you very much. And then I'll go to a question from Francis McAdon. Thank you for being with us, Francis. Francis asks, hi, on the use of AI to forecast flooding, uh, is there any data yet on how accurate this has been? That's Francis, Francis McAdon, who's from the Department of Agriculture, Food and the Marine. Yeah, so the two examples that I gave of coastal sure. flooding and uh, and the river flow flooding. So um, the the um, one that's more progressed in terms of the research that we've been um, undertaking is the is the river flow. As I think mm -hmm. I was, uh, you know, I showed you some of the results that are looking very promising um, in terms of that approach. Um, the coastal flooding example is um, somewhat earlier stage in terms of the approach. Um, in part, we're looking at slightly different things in the two contexts. So the, the work that we've done to date on the river flooding was the project thing we were trying to project was peak flow rates in the river. Um, on the coastal flooding thing uh, side of things, we what we're actually trying to project is slightly different. And in fact, one of the things we discovered early on was when we looked at the records of um there's a there's a for the somebody there's been some research done on the UK context looking at the most impactful as in the most amount of damage done by different coastal flood events and when we looked at the data set interestingly um, that didn't exactly correspond with the highest tidal levels mm -hmm. and so understand so it's not so so there's two slightly different things that you can project one is peak flow and or um, highest tidal levels, and the other is the amount of damage done in different um, mm. contexts. And so what we're trying to do at the moment with the coastal flooding 
side of things is really understand what it, exactly the different criteria are for creating maximum damage associated with um, floods. Because as I say, it doesn't seem to be exactly that it's the highest tidal levels. And that's the other thing that we're that that's a real benefit of these more data driven approaches um, compared to the more traditional physics based approaches is that we can you, we can look at data driven approaches to create that bridge between the physically defined quantities and the things that mo you know the things that actually impact whether or not that is economic damage or whether it's um, damage to health for example um, from from in different environmental um uh environmental extremes extremely interesting this is all extremely interesting i i'm going to tack on a, a preface to to a question we have i noticed when you when you had the, the river flow forecasts um part of your presentation and the map obviously and understandably covers the four nations of the uk but obviously this country is physically integrated with the united kingdom and i'm just wondering is there anything, and perhaps you don't, but is there anything that you know about the um, all the stuff you said about coastal erosion and peatlands and stuff? Absolutely the same in the, in Ireland. Uh, matters of central political importance. That's my preface to Dara Lawler's question. Do you think your very interesting framework could be applied within Ireland, and if so, how? And are there, is there anything kind of that you find curious about the case in Ireland that would make it different or similar to the case of the Fenlands? I, think, I mean, I'm, I'm sure we could exactly transfer the things that we've been mm. doing into the Irish context or indeed um, anywhere else. Um, the, um, I mean, so for all the machine learning AI type approaches that we've been developing, um, the most critical thing is to have the underlying data sets in order to be able to train models on. Mm -hmm. As I was describing with the river flow example, we're also looking at approaches where we can then do transfer learning from an environment where we do have data to an environment where we have less data. Um, so that is also possible. But in terms of um, looking at similar issues for um, in, in the context of Ireland, then I'm, I, I, you know, I mean, I'm sure that much of it is directly transferable, at, at, at very least in terms of methodologies. Mm -hmm. Excellent. And, and and actually, I should say, you know, if anybody wants to reach out, if we're, it, uh, we'd be delighted to collaborate and share any of the work that we've done to date. So please do reach out. There is at least one person who's made contact to ask if they can make contact with you. In fact, Professor, so yes. we'll share their contact details with uh, with you after the after the call. I was going to put one more um, kind of specific question from from an attendee to you, and then I'll have one final uh, kind of general question. But indeed, to the audience, I think we've gotten through a a, yeah, a great group of questions and thank you to Professor Shukbuk for going through them so carefully but if you have any final ones now is your time there is one I'd like to put to you from uh, Keelan O'Sullivan who is uh, uh, our climate and energy researcher currently at the IIA Keelan says it is clear from your remarks that AI is crucial to mitigating and responding to climate change what are some of the barriers that exist in operationalizing AI generally to its full potential in this regard and are there areas where key investment is still needed i guess that's about how can we persuade people that ai or uh, artificial intelligence is is good and people needn't be afraid of its usage um well actually i think there's two things there actually one is one is the last point you made about how do we you know make set ai in in a in a responsible setting actually is the critical bit and it comes maybe in some ways it comes back to that trust word that i was uh, yeah. using in a different context earlier um the other area is actually just a, from the practicalities side of it so what we have found at least that you know this might change over time but at least at the current time to really maximize the use of machine learning and AI technologies, you have to have a, uh, an environment where you can bring together those people with the computer science background who understand where the cutting edge and mm -hmm. the opportunities for, um, uh, uh, in terms of new AI technologies and approaches together with people with the domain expertise on the environmental science side of things or whichever other application domain you're wanting to apply the AI to mm -hmm. um, and really um, create an environment where they can work very collaboratively together and understand that the, both sides um, because there's still, you know, it's getting that that um, interaction between those two communities 
working effectively that's critically important and so investment in in bringing those two together I think is absolutely critical and that I mean in in the UK there is a lot of um, investment currently being made exactly on that um, interface so I'm hopeful that actually if you if we roll up forward a couple of years then that situation might be quite different because we'll have made those bridges and we'll have created if you like, a, um, a whole community of people who already, you know, who are trained in understanding both areas. And mm-hmm. then we don't have that, you know, we're not, it's, it isn't two different communities, but at the moment it still is. And that's where the greatest barrier currently is. Um, but doing all of that crucially in a context of understanding the broader um, uh, responsible innovation aspects is is clearly very important, especially on um, anything that involves vast amount of data, much of which can end up, even if you think about it, you know, even if you think compared to health data, for example, much of the um, environmental data isn't so personalized, but there are still, when you get below the surface, there are many aspects which do have those sort of ethical questions that need to be considered. Very much. It's remarkable how your work is so, at, it's at the cutting edge of so much new stuff, you know, AI and climate and various technologies, but it still boils down to that kind of fundamental notion of trust, right? And of kind of people knowing how to work together in an ethical fashion. Uh, We're going to wrap up pretty presently. I'm going to throw down a challenge to any of my colleagues. I'm looking for the recording of our event from before Christmas with Kathy O'Neill, The Weapons of Math Destruction, which is a brilliant session that we had. I think it was in November. And if anyone can find it, we'll share it in the chat for those attending. It's on the website, but it's really good. And it was getting to the kind of the, the similar kernel, Professor, what, what, what you were talking about, about the kind of knowability of artificial intelligence and kind of understanding how decisions are made and stuff. And it's a it's a puzzle that's going to remain with us, I think. A very general final question to you, Professor, and then you, 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 by all means, you'll have a minute to wrap up with anything else you want to say. But Cambridge Zero, is there a is there a shelf life? Is there is there an end game? What are your medium to long term plans for this excellent initiative? If you could share it, yeah. So I mean, our our, our mission with Cambridge Zero is is really to support um, ambitious climate action within the university and er- and everything we can do to facilitate um, that beyond uh, the university. And um, we, I mean, is there a shelf life? It's it's very much um, a challenge oriented mm. initiative so whilst um climate change remains a significant global challenge then we are wanting to ensure that the university is bringing all its assets and resources towards helping to support the response to that i you know in a, a, a the shelf life one hopes is short because we hope that the global community comes together rapidly mm. and addresses the climate challenge. Unfortunately, um, we don't appear to be on that track at the moment, but as a global community, um, but uh, the university is absolutely committed to um, to, to really maximising its, um, its response to that challenge. Fantastic. Thank you. I thought I was being provocative with that question, actually. But, <laughs> um, good to know. OK, I am. Um... I think we'll call it a day there. I wasn't able to find the link. It's going to be on our YouTube channel for Kathy O'Neill. As will this event as well. One of your, one of the questioners asked if the recording will be available. It'll be both on the IIA website and indeed on YouTube as well. So just to thank Professor Schuchberg really both for your excellent presentation, but also for your brilliant work. It's highly inspiring. There's lots of people on the call working in various parts of public policy, mainly in Ireland, but also elsewhere. And I'm sure you've provided loads of food for thought. So thanks and good luck with your important work. Uh, thank you to the EPA for this um sponsoring the series and looking forward to continuing this great collaboration and thank you to my team at the IIA for pulling it all together uh, finally thanks of course to our audience and for your excellent questions i wish you all a great afternoon thanks all <laughs>